Today, as we come to the table. Now, when you're in the family, you're literally in the family. You ever had those families, you go over to their house and they're so accepting. You know, you're just, you're part of the family. You just grab stuff out of the fridge, you know, watch whatever you want, do whatever, use their little boat out back, whatever the, whatever the case might be, you're, you're, they consider you part of the family. But, but, but you know and they know you're not really a part legally of the family, but they love you and you're just as welcome. You really are. When you get in the Lord's kingdom, it's really your house, your, your, your paddle boat, your refrigerator. It's really yours, and you really are a family member. You're not just, I mean, you're in. This is who our family is. It's Jesus. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you become a brother or sister in His family. God becomes your Father, and you're given all the rights to the inheritance of His infinite wealth of grace, love, and freedom. You're no longer bound by the chains of slavery to your sinfulness. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. As Pastor Mark will illustrate in today's message, the level of hospitality you'll find in God's family is beyond comprehension. You're welcomed with warmth and care and invited to be adopted. You don't have to clean yourself up to come in. God is offering you righteousness and freedom through Christ. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians chapter 4 as he begins his message, From Slaves to Sons. Paul is making the point here that those who put themselves again under the law are not only still immature in the things of the Father, but they're living under a harsh guardian called legalism. And until this changes, they're not ready to walk in the full sonship of God nor will they ever walk in freedom. Again, it's like, you know, you're, you've just graduated spiritual college, Paul is saying is, and these guys are pulling you back into spiritual kindergarten. They want to take you back to the ABCs of the law when God is saying, walk in freedom and go out and be a witness to me, making disciples to the ends of the earth and enjoying the kingdom that the Father's given you. Not because you have to again, but because you want to. Well, let's jump into it because that was quite a long intro, but we needed it. Notice what he says here in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, now I say that an heir, as long as he's a child, here's that example starting, and they all would have known this. Remember, these are Romans he's writing to, and Gentiles, Jews. He does not differ at all from a slave, though he's the master of all. See, he's still under that pedagogue. He's still under that harsh ruler, that harsh disciplinarian, but really he owns everything. He's just too immature now to take it for himself. And so he says, until we grow out of that, we can't walk in the inheritance that belongs to us. And so we have to first get past that place to move on to the next area. And this is interesting because how we view ourselves in light of this will tell us who we are in the Lord. And what do I mean by that? Note this. If we are only motivated to obey God based on the fear of what will happen if we don't obey him, we're still operating as a slave in relation to God rather than a son or a daughter. You shouldn't be motivated by fear. You shouldn't be saying, okay, I've got to obey because I'm going to get in trouble. What he's saying is you still need, you haven't grown yet. And he's not belittling the Galatians. He's not belittling any of us in here today. If he's saying this to our heart, he's saying it's time to realize that if you're motivated by fear for the things of God, you're not growing up. You're still held in that childhood. You still got the weight of that harsh disciplinarian, the law, the pedagogue, watching over everything you do. When you need to learn to say, you know what, Lord, I'm motivated for a different thing. That is if we're motivated not by fear, but if we're motivated by love to obey the Lord, Now we're operating as a true and full member of the family. What did Paul say? He said the love of God constrains. My my boundaries, Paul said this, I've got boundaries. I've got boundaries. My boundaries are the love of God. It's because I love him. Not because I have to. What did Joseph say? I, I I can't sleep with you, Potiphar's wife, because the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. Again, the law had not even been given yet. But again, if he could have even said that, but what did he say? He goes, I don't want to hurt God. 
It, for Joseph, it was about his relationship. It wasn't motivated because he'd get in trouble. It was like, I, I, I love God. I'll trust him. I'll do it his way. God will give me a wife one day. And all these things that God has designed, I'll have those pleasures, but I'm not going to do this in a sinful way. And so that's how we are as we grow in Christ. The enemy wants us to go for all the sinful pleasures now and do everything the wrong way. And God says, I created all this. I gave you all the pleasures of life. And heaven are pleasures forevermore. And how that's going to bear out in the spirit, I don't know, but it's going to be awesome because the Bible says down here is just a shadow. And if there's this many opportunities to have this much fun as a shadow, what's it going to be like when the real thing comes along? You follow me? And God says, it's there forever for you. But do it my way. Trust me. Wait on me. Do, do it the way I prescribed, and you won't have the consequences of sin or the separation from God. So Paul is laying the foundation for their understanding. Um, should they continue to pursue the law, that is, they would never be free, only motivated by fear, while a son would not only be free, but one day inherit all that the father owned and be motivated by love and again, uh, holding them, holding us in spiritual immaturity. And by using this analogy, Paul is pointing out those bound by the law. Again, a reality. It's not just bondage, but again, immaturity. You see, this is, this is something that we have to grow beyond. While those who walk in the freedom of Christ are moving on in spiritual adulthood. He says, these Galatians, these guys that are coming into you guys, not the Galatians, but these Judaizers, these that are following the law that are coming into you Galatians, they're trying to pull you back into a spiritual immaturity. Don't let them do it. Fight it. Move forward in Christ. And so he says, but they're under guardians or stewards till the time is appointed by the Father. And that's, that, again, that pedagogue. He says, even so, we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, he now uses the way the world works to make his point. And that is, even as we live in a world that controls our actions by how it operates, so too those living under the law live in such a way that rules and regulations control their lives. You know, a lot of the, the whole thing with the law and freedom is a mental battle. It is hard to break away from the law because our world operates in what is called a cause and effect. We have a cause and effect world. I mean, if you hit your foot on something, your toe hurts. If you do bad at work, you're going to be chastised by your boss. If you do good at work, you're going to be rewarded by your boss. And while there is an application in the believer's life to obedience and blessing, disobedience and cursing, while that's true, that's not how it operates in God's family. You are in the family through Jesus Christ, not by what you do or don't do. It's what he did. You just have to believe it. But because we have this cause and effect elements of the world around us, it messes with our mind and we feel like we've got to read this much time or pray this much time or do this many things or be this whatever. And God's saying, that has nothing to do with it. You're already in the family. It is a done deal if you've received Christ. Now it's learning how to walk as a son or a daughter in Christ and not this cause and effect thing that we're limited to by the natural world. And so, uh, again, the fullness. He said, these are the elements of the world. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, that is the right moment for God to send Jesus into the world. Everything had to be right. There was world peace. The roads were all, I mean, everything was ready for the gospel. It was perfect. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Notice this, to redeem or buy back. It means to purchase those who were under the law. That's us that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, there's quite a few things to unpack here. Paul now uses the analogy we spoke of earlier of, of the child coming into full adulthood and heirship as a son at the right time. And notice he also even refers to God coming to the earth in the fullness of time. At the right time, God came, and at the right time, God will bring you as a son into the kingdom of God or as a daughter into the kingdom of God. It may be your day today. One of you, one of you may, today may be the day appointed for you. And if God's working in your heart and convicting you that you need to give your life to Jesus, this is the fullness of time for you. It's appointed for you. But it's interesting because when this time came, the language used to describe Jesus coming means he was sent as an ambassador for the Father to bring the Father's message of hope and salvation to the world. But he not only brought the message, he himself was the instrument that would be used to fulfill the message in his sacrifice. I mean, think about this when you consider sharing your faith or heading out into the mission field or feeling like you're leaving the comforts of the world behind. Jesus left the palaces of heaven and came into a fallen world to live for us and not only to live for us, but to allow his creation to put him to death so that we might have the kingdom of God with him. 
I mean, that puts a real perspective on it when we think, oh, no, I don't know that I want to share because they might not like me anymore. Or I don't want to go on the, you know, mission field because there might be a bug or something. You know, I don't like bugs any more than you guys do, right? There's some, there's some weird stuff out there, okay? But the bottom line is when you realize what Jesus gave up, I mean, think about it. And then, and then he asks us to, it's really nothing compared to what he's done for us. But it wasn't just to bring a message like we do when we, get, when we came out, as, as I said, he knew he was coming to die and, and to allow the world to put him to death. Paul's point is that although we as children of God will not only inherit the kingdom of God one day and rule over it with Jesus, and we will do that, until that time we're no different in many ways than the unbeliever in relation to our reward. Not in relation to the unbeliever and being saved. We're saved or not. But here's the thing, because we may not see a reward down here, yet we get discouraged. Your reward is coming. It's going to be a great reward. You know, I mean, the bottom line is, is that, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I came in this morning and oftentimes I'll walk in and I'll see things that need to be done. Hey, could you do that? Could you do that? Go get that. Make sure that's done or whatever. And I'm sitting there after I did that and I jumped down and started, you know, reading through the word and getting ready, looking over my notes before I get in there. And I thought, you know what? I wonder how it looks to the staff. I walk in, I start pointing for things to do, right? And I thought, you know what? I appreciate these guys. They're a blessing to me. And I grabbed one of them after. I said, you know what? I appreciate your heart and your attitude. I said, I walk in on Sunday mornings. and I'm so focused on what needs to be done. I see things, this, this, and I send you guys to do it. I said, you always do it, and you do it with a good heart and a good attitude. I said, there's going to be great reward in the kingdom of God for that. I said, as a matter of fact, I'll probably be your servant in the kingdom, so be nice to me. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be nice to you now because you're so obedient. I'll be serving you. And that's how it works. The temporary positions we have now does not mean that in heaven, that'll be my body. No, uh, 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 uh. How faithful we are to what we're called to do now will depend on where we are in our position in the kingdom of God. And by the way, that's a good motivation to be loving each other and be kind to each other. You know, you know the person that kind of bugs you, the Christian that kind of bugs you. You can think of who they are. You got them in your mind. Well, different, different personalities. Okay. If they're being more obedient to the Lord when they get in the kingdom, it's they're going to be the ones that are elevated. You know, I mean, we need to realize we're dealing with the family of God. Our full reward will not be realized until the kingdom of God. Uh, however, when the time is right, God will place us as true sons and daughters and rulers over his household in the kingdom of God. Now, we pointed out the word redeem here. I love this word because it not only means purchased from slavery, which is what it means, but it means purchased from slavery for the purpose of being set free. And there's an emphasis here on simply being set free. You see, in this day, there's two things you could do for a slave. You could either buy a slave and just make them your slave, which would be in that day with that mindset of slavery would have probably been a wise investment. They weren't thinking godly. They're thinking investment. Well, I'm going to buy this slave. It belongs to me and I'll use this for my resources in my home or my fields or whatever. But there was another way you could buy a slave just to set them free. You imagine somebody with just huge amounts of money walk in the slave market and you're one of the slaves and you don't know it. And you're standing up there, and they go, I'll take those 10. And you're like, oh, man, I hope this guy's nice, you know. And they bring you down, and, you're, and, you, and that day you just accept it. Here I am. I've been captured in warfare or whatever the case might be. I'm a slave to this person, passed down, whatever the case might be. And he turns, we, get, we walk out of the slave market, and he gets us out and goes, all right, guys, you're all free. What? Yeah, you're free. You're all free. You mean we're not going to serve you? No, I just, I, I had the resources, and it was in my heart to set you free. Here, here's your papers. Go, go. How would you feel? Skipping down the road with your papers, I'm free. Now think about this. What if the person stopped you and says, wait a minute, one more thing. Anything, yes. I also legally made you my family. You don't have to, you know, come live in my home, but that palace back there, yeah, it's yours now. What? Yeah, you're not only free, but if you want to come live with me and, and just love me and I love you and be a part of the family, you're in. See, this is what God has done for everybody in this room. He purchased you and he set you free, but he didn't stop there. He said, guess what? I have another surprise for you. Not only are you forgiven and going to be in heaven forever, you're my family member. And he's going to get into more detail of this in just a moment. The word here literally means you're purchased out of the slave market by Jesus for the sole purpose of being set free, not to be a slave of Jesus by force, but to serve as a family member out of love. And Paul's point is clear. Why would you want to go back into slavery of the law, living as a non-family member like a slave, after being set free from your slavery and being a son? And notice Paul himself here uh, says Jesus became a man under the law so that he could bring us out of it. And here's something else you've got to understand about this verse. 
And that is this, the word adoption here was used in a very different way in that day as it's used today. And I almost wish that translators would change the word adoption in here, although that's what it means, so we'd have a better understanding of it. So I'm going to give you a better understanding of it. First of all, adoption in our day means, in essence, someone who is not born of our family bloodline, but is then brought into the family as a family member. Okay, they weren't really from our coming together as husband and wife. We brought them from the outside, different bloodline, but we've taken them as our own and they're accepted as a family member. And that's beautiful and that's wonderful and that's exciting for those who don't have a mom and dad and they've got that. But this is something that changes everything and what adoption meant in that day. Adoption was, was referred, yes, to those brought outside, but adoption was referred to those who are already in the bloodline. All it means is they've now transitioned from a child to an adult. They've been adopted from childhood to adulthood would be a better way to say it. And what's the, this changes everything in our understanding because listen to what this means. It, it's not simply that we're adopted in God's family having a different bloodline and God says, okay, Mark can come to heaven. I'll let him in. He asked Jesus into his heart. We'll accept him, but we'll always, always know that he's really not in the family, but we're going to let him in because, you know, whatever. No, here's what this means. You are actual family members of Jesus Christ and the Father, not just accepted in, but supernaturally transferred in by being born again through his blood on the cross. So you are, here's what happens. When you receive Christ and you're born again, you are a blood family member of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me on this? You're a blood family member. You're not just brought in. You have been through his blood supernaturally just, just melded and molded into Jesus Christ. You are his child as much as anybody's his child. It's as if God's saying, see how Jesus Christ is my son? You're just as much my son and daughter as Jesus Christ. That's a mind blower. And if that's not sinking in, you're not understanding what God has said to you. You're just as much a child of God as Jesus Christ is. You're not like Jesus Christ. He's God. You're not but you're a child just as much in the Father's eyes, not by simple acceptance through legal adoption, signing papers, but through a blood connection, a bloodline supernaturally put in place by Jesus Christ. Very exciting. So now when you're in the family, you're literally in the family. You ever had those families, you go over to their house and they're so accepting. You know, you're just, you're part of the family. You just grab stuff out of the fridge, you know, watch whatever you want, do whatever, use their little boat out back, whatever the, whatever the case might be, you're, you're, they consider you part of the family. But, but, but you know and they know you're not really a part legally of the family, but they love you and you're just as welcome. You really are. When you get in the Lord's kingdom, it's really your house, your, your, your paddle boat, your refrigerator, it's really yours, and you really are a family member. You're not just, I mean, you're in. This is who our family is. It's Jesus. And he says, so this is what's happened. You've been purchased. You've been brought in as sons, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You ever just had a worship song start or something, and just this explosion of worship straight to heaven. It's like, oh, Lord, something happens inside of you, and you feel it. There's an emotion. There's a connection. That's what he's talking about. He says, I'm proving that you're my child. I've put it in you so that all of a sudden, spontaneously, out of nowhere, comes this worship. I mean, Lord, you're so good. The world doesn't do that. The world doesn't have that. You're the one connected to the family. You're the one that God's speaking to. It is his spirit stirring your spirit on the inside that cries, Abba, Father, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So he ends this thought today by saying, if you've been born again into the family of God, you're no longer a slave. You're now a son uh, or daughter with the full rights of a son or daughter, the, a full bloodline inherited into the father's love, into the father's kingdom, into the father's belongings. Uh, the question is, are you in the family? Are you in the family? Now, for those of you who know you're in the family, here's really where my heart is today, that God would grow you up into a full sense of maturity that you're no longer bound by the guilt of the law. Yes, you see the moral truth of it. Yes, you follow the word of God as truth, and that is the guide for your life. But it's not something that, it's something you do because you get to, not because you have to. And it's a love relationship. You love him. He loves you. And every, you just, you're, you're a functioning part of the family, okay? You, you don't need your pedagogue anymore. You don't need the law breathing down your neck. You're now a full son in adulthood. If you don't have that, I want to pray for you that you would have that. But lastly, and I often do this as well, 
if you're not brought into the family yet, maybe you're still standing in the slave market. I'm not a slave. You are a slave. You know what? I had another title for today, and I didn't do it because it was a whole other direction. They ended up going somewhere else. And, and I, maybe I'll use it some other time, and I'll blow it now. But I was going to call it today Planet of the Slaves. Because we live on a planet. We're all slaves. Everybody in this room is a slave if you don't know Christ. Maybe not a slave by the traditional that we know in this world, such as slavery. But the Bible says everybody on this planet, we are the planet of the slaves. And God sent someone to come down and buy our planet back and set every one of us free. And he said, not only have I set you free, I made you a family member, a real one, by real blood that now courses through our, our spiritual veins together because I have a new body and you're going to get a new body. And my blood's going to connect us as real family for eternity. That's what I offer. If you don't know Jesus Christ, he will set you free from the slave market of sin today. He will set you free from the bondage of judgment that's, that you're facing one day but you've got to confess. You've got to say, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. You've got to believe Jesus died for you. And here's something I can't leave out. You've got to repent. We don't hear that much in the church today, do we? Repentance is a word that, what does repent mean? It just means you stop sinning and start living righteously for God. You turn away from what you know is wrong and you turn toward what you know is right. And if you do that, family member with full rights. I want to give you that opportunity. I'd love to have you be a part of the family. It's a big family. We have plenty of room for a lot more people. The Lord has a, a very large table. You need to go to somebody's house and have that big family table and everybody sits around and eats and maybe it's a big Thanksgiving type celebration or whatever. The Bible says when Jesus comes at the rapture of the church, he's going to yank all the believers out of here and we're going to be around a gigantic table in the kingdom. The wedding supper of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to be there with the Lord celebrating this huge feast. And we're all going to be there together. And we're all going to be family. I mean, we're going to be real family together. King David is your real family. He's your brother. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Billy Graham, real family. Jesus Christ, real family. And we're going to be there feasting together, celebrating with the Lord for seven years. That's going to be a great meal. And by the way, no calories, no weight gain, nothing. Just all the fun and none of the mess, right? Tell I'm getting older, can't you? But either way, <laughs> then what happens? Then we all saddle up. We come back to the earth. Jesus Christ establishes literally his throne on the temple mount. And you will be robed with the robes of kings. You say, why not queens? There won't be, the Bible says male or female in heaven. What is it going to be like? I don't, there is some, some semblance of male because male is all that's used in the sense of he. The angels are all he's, all that. So there's some, but God says it's not going to be like it is on earth. We'll be all the same somehow. How that's going to be, I don't know. But you're going to have placed on you a robe of royalty. And not just pretend real royalty, real authority, real power. And it's not going to be coming with pride and arrogance. We're all going to just be like that humble king, that, you know, that, the person that has that power but knows how to love people and just give everything away. We're all going to love each other more than we love ourselves. We're going to love the Lord. We're going to go to Jerusalem and have feasts. Every year they'll be having feasts up there, celebrating with the Lord, celebrating on the earth for a thousand years. I mean, I can't imagine what that's going to be like. And then it only gets better because he's going to destroy this heaven and this earth, the Bible says, because it's been tainted by sin. And he's going to build a brand new one that we've never seen. And we're going to live forever with the Lord in that kingdom. I give you an invitation today. Guess what? The chariot just rolled up out front. The king's courier stopped out. Hear ye, hear ye. You, fill in the blank, have an invitation to the great banquet that lasts forever. What are you going to do with it? While our time at the table of God's word is ending for today, please keep reading in the book of Galatians. If you missed any part of this broadcast on Come to the Table or you want to hear it again, visit thewaymedia.net. You can also subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Again, just visit thewaymedia.net, then click on Come to the Table. You can also join us on Facebook. You can get the latest information along with some inspiration and encouragement for your newsfeed. There is a link at thewaymedia.net. Our expository teachings through Galatians touch on good and relevant topics such as faith versus works and how to work through differences like race and ethnicity hot topics that are hitting our culture today like never before. On behalf of Pastor Mark, we'd appreciate your prayers during this study. We ask that you'd pray for our nation, for the culture around us, and that God would work in the lives of followers and those who are yet to follow Him. Please pray that the Holy Spirit would lead those who don't know Him to hear this program so that they can find hope in Jesus. Pray that each listener would have open ears and soft hearts. 
We know the message of Jesus can transform lives and mend the differences that so many are struggling with. So thanks for lifting your fellow listeners up to the Lord. And we hope you can join us as we continue exploring the book of Galatians the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.